Okay, so just out of the gate, right off the bat, however you want to, whatever cliche you want to use, if you haven't read the story yet, don't watch this video. Okay? If you haven't read the story, don't watch this video because it's going to ruin the things that make this story so great. A Rose Family by William Faulkner. So read that story. Okay? And now I'm going to proceed as if you have. Now, before we can talk about this story, I need to introduce some new concepts to you. All right, so, so far in this class, we've thought about uh, first-person and third-person narration. We've thought about first-person narration, you know, being attributed to um, usually the, the main character, okay, in the story. I did this, I went here, I saw this, I saw that. We get that in everyday use. We get that in Uncle Ben's Choice. We get that in What You Pawn, I Will Redeem, first-person narrator. We've also thought about third-person narrator which is this voice that's external to the action, so it's not pegged to a specific character in the story, but it's this voice that describes everything that happens in the story. If we think about The Swimmer, if we think about uh, At Home, if we think about uh, The Open Boat, if we think about The Story of an Hour, all of those stories have a kind of a third-person narrator. Okay, So there is this voice that exists, that relates all the events. We need to add a couple of new terms today. The first term we need to add is you need to learn the term omniscient. Omniscient. Okay? An omniscient narrator could be first, could be third, doesn't matter. An omniscient narrator is a narrator that understands absolutely everything. Okay? Has access to the thoughts people have in their heads can describe conversations uh, between people that have never otherwise met. Um, it's like the godlike perspective. Okay, the omniscient narrator has kind of complete understanding of an event. And if we were to look at the stories that we've read so far, you could you could argue that some of these third-person narrators are omniscient. So, for example, uh, the the voice in the swimmer seems to have access to everything, has access to Nettie's mind, has access to describing the world, has access to talking about the past and the present with foreshadowing, things like that. If we think about at home, uh, the smoking story, that story is told it's about the father and the son having a conversation, but there's this contextualizing voice who's able to get in and out of people's heads and describe everything. If we think about the story of an hour, the exact same thing. Third person, describing the events in the Mallard ho household can move in and out of perspectives, in and out of rooms, can give you any details that are required at any point in the story. The same is true of the open boat. We have this voice that's reporting everything that's happening to the correspondent, the wounded captain, the oiler, um, and the cook. I hope. It escaped my mind there for a moment. I'm not omniscient. Uh, but anyway, omniscient narrators can give you all the details that you need. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to give it to you straight. They might hedge. They might manipulate you. But we understand the voice has kind of total access. Okay. When we think about that, we might also understand there's what's also referred to as an om a narrator with limited omniscience. Limited omniscience omniscience okay and a narrator with limited omniscience is a, is a narrator that seems to have access to a lot of information that an average person wouldn't have but there are some things that they don't know there are some things that they are unaware of so they're not speaking necessarily with a godlike perspective they're simply talking to you um, with a lot of extraordinary information but there might be some characters that can't give good insight into, there might be some conversations they're incapable of describing. And we'll think more about limited omniscience and omniscience as we go through the course. Those terms are important today because in A Rose for Emily we have a really interesting narrator. Okay, and let's talk a little bit about that. So if you go to page 133, which is the beginning of, of A Rose for Emily, um, let's look at that very opening line. Okay, when Miss Emily Grierson died, our whole town went to her funeral. 
That hour is crucial, and it comes up at numerous points in the text. When we read the story, we need to understand that the voice that's speaking to us is like the collective knowledge of the town. Okay, it's the collective wisdom, it's essentially the perspective of the town and the people who live in the town. And it's their perspective and it's, it's, it's focused on Miss Emily. Now, as a group, as a collective perspective, this voice can tell us a lot of things. Okay, but it's not omniscient. And that's really important to understand. So what's related to us is everything as it's received from the perspective of the town. So the conversations the town people have with Miss Emily are recorded. The different questions and the confusion that the town has about her is, is, is recorded as well. We also need to think about a couple other things. And this is going to get slightly technical, but it's going to help us understand the story. Okay, This story is told in the past tense, and that's important. Not every story that we read is going to be told in the past tense. All of the events that are being related to you here from the perspective of the town, okay, which is our narrator, uh, are coming to us and they're describing the past. And that's important because the voice that's telling us all this information already knows the big event that occurs at the end, right? Because that too occurred in the past. But it's talking to us in a way so that we won't know the really important detail that shows up at the end until we actually get there. All right. So, you know, the, the voice here, okay, it's, 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 it's a collective voice. Okay, it's an us uh, that's standing in as the narrator. Um, but it's not, it's not third person. It, it, it's basically the town that's speaking to us. So in that sense, it's it's kind of like first person, it's, but it's a we instead of an I, okay? It's an R instead of an I. Um, it's speaking to us from its perspective. Now, the perspective of the town is far greater than that of any individual living in it, all right? So the voice has something like limited omniscience because it can give us all these various perspectives, all these different interactions with Miss Emily that no one person had. So we get kind of this limited omniscience and we get kind of the view of the town. It tries to stay kind of um, true to what was actually known about Miss Emily as she went through her life. So nobody knew the big thing revealed at the end I hope you've read the story, um, in the town until collectively they all got there. So as we go through the story, what we're basically getting is all of the questions, concerns, and the frustrations that come up for the townspeople because they don't know the big thing that we get at the end of the story. Uh, so that's limited omniscience. The narrator could have simply blurted it out and told you right at the beginning. But again, the story wouldn't have been nearly as interesting, and a bunch of the significant aspects of the story wouldn't have stood out necessarily as being so significant. So anyway, taking, taking about nine minutes there, I hope you wrote down some of those terms. We're thinking about first person, we're thinking about third person, we're thinking about omniscience, which is another level of classification, we're thinking about limited omniscience, and we're thinking about the significance of limited omniscience to the collective perspective of the town, which is who or what is telling us this story. That R is important. Okay, we'll see this again and again and again. Now, with all of that aside, what does this narrator give us? The narrator gives us a really interesting description of not just the life of Miss Emily, but also through the important details that are presented along the way, a good sense of how this southern town, right, has transformed in the post-Civil War decades really coming up into the 20th century, right? And what we see is how some of the kind of old haunting leftovers of the actually even pre-Civil War era in terms of slavery, in terms of how the white characters interact with the African-American characters, 
in society in terms of the roles men and women play in society in terms of expectations of marriage and all these things in the South, how all of that carries on and over across the decades. So we get that really neat historical perspective, right? Which in our daily lives, most of us all have a historical perspective, but we might not think about the world that way all that often. How has your hometown transformed in the past 50 or 60 years? If you look at some of the elderly people living in your hometown and you imagine if they were there when they were younger, what's the world been like as they've experienced it? Have they changed with it or have they not changed with it? Um, a question only you can answer, perhaps, through your observation, but this is a story that I think works particularly well for, for, for readers in a state like Maine. Um, because there are so many people in the state of Maine who have lived their entire lives in the same town. Large groups of people who live their, their entire lives in the same town. Which is very normal in northern New England. It's not necessarily as normal in the rest of the other parts of the United States, where populations are more migratory transitory. So in Maine, just like, you know, um, um, in, in this story, um, you can you can say, oh yeah, there's this person who lives uh, in my neighborhood and the family's been here for years and the family has a deep history and that person's lived in that their same house their whole life. I, have, I, I know people uh, professionally who live in the same houses that they grew up in as children and are now well into middle, in some cases, old age. So it's not that uncommon in Maine. So we have this perspective of the town. And the town's talking to us about Miss Emily. Miss Emily is a character that superficially there doesn't appear to be that much to, right? She's this kind of sad, reclusive, um, aging uh, figure who has been part of the town seemingly forever and has just kind of cut herself off from uh, everyone else, and it essentially is an eyesore. Her house is an eyesore. That's actually made explicit. Um, da, da, da. Um, in the second paragraph, and I am, yeah, yeah, an eyesore among eyesores. On the, excuse me, the first full paragraph on 144. Uh, but garages and cotton gins had encroached and obliterated even the August names of that neighborhood. Only Miss Emily's house was left lifting its stubborn and coquettish decay above the cotton wagons and the gasoline pumps, an eyesore among eyesores. So she's just this kind of, you know, decrepit holdover from an earlier time. And viewed with about that much respect by the people in the town, right? But as we move into the story, one of the things we start to learn is that there might be a great deal more to this individual than is simply evident on the surface. So we have that really creepy scene uh, in the first section where the board of aldermen go to see her to get their taxes from her, and she appears like this, like this doughy, um, uh, I guess the word kind of damp comes to mind, but she's just like in the dark all the time, and she's, uh, she's really fat, and she has like a cane, and uh, the really distinctive uh, necklace that hangs down to her belt. She she kind of feels like a, like a spider has kind of crawled out of one of the stairways, right? And she just starts screaming things at them that don't make any sense, that she doesn't pay any taxes because, you know, Colonel Sartoris said that she didn't have to, even though he's long dead. So she's just confusing and she's unpleasant in terms of her description and location and attitude with the rest of the town. But we don't really get a sense of just how unpleasant a person she is until we start to reflect on her life story and then we start to put the pieces together, right? So we have the, the, the father and then the suitor who wants to marry her, Homer Baron, right? Who then vanishes. And after she dies, what we learn is, and I hope you've read the story already, that there was a lot more going on in that house than we knew about because they find the body upstairs, right? Um, and this is, I think, the key characteristic of a tale, as discussed in previous classes. What happened? <laughs> because we find the body, Baron's body, in the bed, right? Um, uh, apparently been dead for a very long time, in an intense state of decay, but he's also in a position that indicates 
he has been, you know, embraced or embraced by somebody for a significant period of time. And we find one of the long gray hairs next to the body on the bed. And we know from all the details in the story that there's only certain periods of time when Miss Emily has had long gray hair, right? Um, and these details would lead us to suggest that the body's been there for a while, but perhaps she was upstairs cuddling with it long after uh, it started to decompose, uh, which is really unnerving, right? So, so, so there's this, there's this grotesqueness about her, not just in her like physical appearance or in her demeanor with other people or in her strange reclusive nature, how she pulls away from the rest of the town, but there's this grotesqueness, grotesqueness in the fact that it would appear that she murdered this man, um, but still, you know hung out with him uh, after he was dead and rotting in the bed upstairs. Uh, that's really unnerving. That's that's really gross. Okay, so the question is, well, why, why, oh, why would I need to read the story? Why, oh, why would I need to encounter someone like Miss Emily? I think there's all kinds of interesting things to think about here. We have a story where Miss Emily seems to be standing in for um, a lot of the social values and attitudes that were more significant to this region, okay, in the po in the post Civil War years, um, through 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 the period of the rebuilding of the American South, and then into its eventual transition into modernity. But she seems to represent a lot of values from a previous time and place that have not aged well, to say the least, okay, um, and and seems to be a, a represent a, a representation of of those who have not moved on and changed. Because when we read the story, one of the things you need to understand, or one of the things you might pick up on, excuse me, that first phrase was a little too harsh, but one of the things you might understand is that there's been multiple generations that have gone through this town and these generations have changed. These generations have adopted different values. They've transformed as the world has transformed. Miss Emily has not. Miss Emily wants to keep things the same quite literally and horrifyingly through the grotesque retention of the dead man in her bed, right? So even though uh, she can she, she can control him, she can keep him where she wants to keep him, quite literally by murdering him and leaving the body in the bed, um, she will go to what would seem to be inhuman efforts to keep things the way they were. Now, a great commentary on the American South uh, during the beginning of the 20th century, and certainly leading up, uh, and I want to make sure I get this right, to the publication of this text in the 1930s is this sense that the South has not developed in particular ways with the rest of the United States. And if you don't believe me, look at the history of you know civil rights legislation in the United States and how long it takes to get that even after the Civil War concludes, right? In about a century. A lot of attitudes, some of which are incredibly destructive to civilization. Um, Miss Emily seems to be retaining quite intensely those values. Now, why is she retaining those aspirations and anxieties? Can we look at this story and see her as something other than a villain or as something other than some sad, put-upon, you know, kind of half-wit living by herself in this house who does creepy things? Well, I think if we, if we try to look at her for what she is, and we have to look at her through the perspective of the town here, um, we might ask about her aspirations and her anxiety. So what is it about her life? What, is, what does her life suggest to us? Well, her life as it is lived suggests that she has a strong desire, aspires to retain a certain lifestyle, not to pay taxes because she can't. The town, for all the kicking and screaming that it does, also seems to have some desire to allow her to continue in exactly that way. Otherwise, she wouldn't be allowed to persist, right? She would have been kicked out of her house, the house would have been sold, that eyesore would have been torn down. Why did the town let her persist in that way? I think it's a great question. One of the reasons why I like to read this story is because of how we can get us, not just because it's a neat series of events, but also because we have this really interesting thing going on with the narrator, which is this voice of the town speaking to us. Um, and again, it's, it's all speaking to us in a way that it's, it, it's all talking about the past, 
because not every narrator we get in the sequence is going to be talking to us in the past tense, but it's talking to us in the past. It's, it's, it's revealing information slowly along the way, so it's very intentional, and it's doing this for a purpose, which is so that we don't know what happened until we get to the end, so that we share its experience with Miss Emily, right? Because while this is a fiction, we realize that the town itself had to go through the process that we are now being invited to go through. And probably like the town coming to a similarly unnerved and unnerving uh, realization at the end. So William Faulkner's A Rose for Emily, a uh, great short story, um, and shows us some of the interesting things that can happen when we start playing around with point of view uh, when we're telling stories.